Thank you all for coming. I'm Shalaya Marsh, and this is Naomi Clement. Um, we are the student directors at large um, for the NSICA board. Um, I recently graduated from UNL um, with my MFA, and Naomi is just finishing up at LSU. Um, she is putting on her thesis in about three weeks. Um, so a, a needed break and inspiration to go back and finish up. Uh, we're excited to be here to talk to you about um, putting together proposals. Um, so we're going to go over um, and talk about research, planning, and editing. Um, those are the big topics um, and give you really kind of specific information about, um, about how this process goes. Um, the process of developing your proposal. So research is really essential, and this is essential whether you're applying for an INSECA, um, to present at INSECA, or whether you're applying for a grant, um, whether you're applying for um, an exhibition opportunity. Um, all of this information <coughs> is really applicable to all of those different processes. You really need to understand the, the application process itself um, and what the organization that you're applying for is looking for. Um, and also, you need to understand the topic that you're proposing. So I guess we all understand clay pretty well, right? So it's essential that you do your homework. Um, and I know we don't all like to do homework. This is not the fun part of writing a proposal or um, or even generating ideas, but research is really essential. So there's a couple of tools in terms of preparing an INSECA proposal that are available to you, most of them through our website. Um, this image is of the, the instructions, so there's a PDF, like request for proposals. This is kind of a, uh, a document that contains all the information that you need to know when you're going through the application. That document is actually reproduced in your program guide. Um, so if you if you take have a opportunity, you can actually take a look at this. Rip these two pages out if you're thinking about um, putting a proposal together. This is page 46 and 47, and this actually lays out a lot of the information that I'm going to talk about in the next few slides. Um, all the documents are online. The RFP. There's an online application on, available on the NSICA website. Um, the online application um, gives you all this information and more, plus an online submission form. We're all kind of getting used to um, applying for things online, so that shouldn't be um, too much of a surprise, but it's always a good idea to kind of click through the application before you even start to get a sense of what information you need to prepare and gather together. This is a, the online application form. Again, it gives you what kind of topics are, you can propose, the eligibility, who can propose, the format of the, the application itself. Um, the, it talks a little bit about the adjudication process, which we'll talk about a little bit more later. Um, and then what your responsibilities are if you get selected, because selection for Presenting is not only about presenting, but also um, you got an Inseca journal in your in your packets when you got here. Um, so everybody who presents writes an article for the Inseca journal that is also published, um, which is a, a wonderful um, resource for you if you haven't been able to go to all the presentations. Some of that written information is quite um, wonderful. Um, in terms of research, a lot of the the questions that you have are going to be on. Um, on here, on the online application form. And uh, so again, just do your homework. And then this is really important. It's important that you know we can do a lot of homework, but we also need a little help sometimes. We don't always have all the answers um, available online. There may be something that, a question that comes up about the application process that you think about that um, we haven't thought to put on there. And so it's important that if you do have a question that you ask that question because it will make your proposal stronger. Um, knowing the direction that you're going and having a clear understanding of the application um, and what we're looking for is, is really important. Um, so 
you know, I say do your homework because most of your questions will be answered by doing your homework. But when you have questions left over, feel free to ask them. There's a couple of people that are um, involved primarily in like the online submission forms and and developing of our RFP, the, this document that has, um, you know, the the what hows of the of the application. Um, Mary Clunan, our programs coordinator, can answer a lot of questions for you. Um, and also Kate Vorhas and Candace Finn are two staff members of Inseca. They're very accessible and they know a lot. Um, also, you can ask any board member a question. Um, so after this, you could ask us some questions. Um, but there's a lot of, there's 18 or 20 of us on the board, um, and we all go through the, this process. We understand this process and can answer questions for you. And if we can't answer the question directly, we can point you to the person who can answer your question. So the last thing in terms of doing your homework and your research is to really know your deadline. So write this one down. May 10th is the main program's deadline, um, and that's for you know presenting at conference here. Um, again, on these two pages in the book, um, and at the pages before and the pages after, there are several other um, applications um, that there are deadlines for too. So some of the INSECA exhibitions are in here, as well as um, applications for um, not the main programming, but things like the process room and the demonstrating artists. They're a separate deadline, um, so consult this if you're thinking about applying for one of those things instead of a, this kind of format of presentation. And then I'm going to chat um, just a bit about planning, sort of uh, along with the research part of it, you want to make sure that you're planning ahead and, and sort of thinking ahead to potential um, things that might come up. Um, Brainstorming is always a really great place to start. Again, uh, to start with the planning, you want to be doing this well ahead of the deadline. As a grad student, I know too well that I'm apt to think about these things the day before, um, which often does not make for a super successful proposal. Um, so yeah, uh, brainstorming. I would start with looking at this year's conference um, program and take a look at what was offered um, and think about you know, what you would have liked to see. Um, what do you have to offer? What do you think is missing from programming streams? What are things that your conversations that you're hearing, um, you know, with either your colleagues or fellow students or people here at conference? They're like, you know what? I really wish there'd been something on this. And Sika, what many people don't know, all of our programming is member driven. Every single thing here, other than you know the demonstrating artists, which we, you know, solicit, um, is member driven. Members have applied with this. So if you don't apply we don't know that it's something that you want to hear about, if that makes any sense. Um, so some other things to think about when you're brainstorming, who, who would be served by this presentation? Um, you know, what program strand does it fit in? Do you want to do, you know, do you feel like you have a research topic that you'd like to present on that people would, you know, this great new idea that people would benefit from knowing from? Or do you have a group of friends that you'd like to have a panel discussion with? You can propose a panel, a discussion, a co-lecture, such as July and I are doing here. Um, there's lots of different formats. So that all that information can be found on the website. Um, and yeah, who, who might you be able to present with as well is another thing to think of when you're brainstorming. Um, but think specifically about what, what topic you're interested in, what topic you're an expert in, um, and what you can offer. And if that's been offered recently, we, we tend, when we're looking at programs, we tend to not want to um, repeat content. Or if it's a similar idea, than like say social media or something, we want it approached in a new way. Like last year, I know we had a panel on different social media things versus this year we've got one on Periscope specifically. So we're always trying to sort of keep things new and fresh and not repeat content specifically. Um, and then as part of that sort of planning is just get, sort of goes back to research, gathering the information. What I always like to do when I'm applying for something and everyone's different. I just copy and paste all the info from the call into a Word document. So I can just work from there and like literally answer all the questions in a Word document and then just go back in later and cut and paste. What Shalai said about going through the application to make sure you understand all the steps before you do it. 
um, well ahead of time is a really good idea. I can't tell you the number of applications I've thought like, oh yeah, I know what I need for this. And then, you know, I, it's like 11.50 and the application is due at 12. And I'm like, oh crap, I needed a whole other thing that I didn't think about. So that's why we're really stressing this um, sort of planning and uh, gathering stuff. And then, you know, write, write out a draft. Um, it's basically just English Comp 101. Uh, when I'm writing a proposal idea, I basically just put it all out there, like either bullet points can be a really good place to start, get all your ideas out on the page, no idea is a bad idea at the draft stage. Um, and then start honing in and creating an outline, you know, classic introduction, body, conclusion. Um, so the main elements for a proposal are gonna be the title, the program description, the program guide abstract, and then uh, images, depending on the type of proposal you're doing. So, well, this is sort of the, the order in which you're gonna present, put them into the documents. I would actually start with um, the program description, which is, that's the long, like sort of one page, more in-depth description of what it is you're talking about, where you can really get into the subject. And then from there, narrow down to the um, the program guide abstract. And a really important thing to know about that abstract is that is what is going in the program guide. That's the little paragraph that people are gonna see in the program guide and people are gonna see in the um, app when they're looking. So that's what has to really sell your presentation. Like, why should I go to this? The other key part of selling that is your title. Um, really think about, you know, when you're reading through the program guide, what are the titles that grab you and make you think like, okay, why should I go to this presentation? Why should I care? Um, and that's also, I'll chat about this a bit later on, but something we think about when we're during the, the um, proposals as well. Um, and then once you've got those, the, the images are also a really key part that, especially when we're during that we look to, that shows us, if you've got good quality images as part of your application, that shows us that you've, you've done your research, you've planned, you can actually carry through with what, what you say you're gonna be able to do. Um, so I can't stress that part enough. So, you know, Naomi just said um, in the beginning of when she was talking, no idea is a bad idea, and that's absolutely true. So when you're brainstorming and you're kind of getting those I ideas out there, um, you, may be, you may end up with a, a program description that's like five pages long and rambles like wandering r around like a river. Um, it's important that your program description doesn't stay that way, and so editing is really, really, really essential. Um, you really want to, um, you know, take that unstructured piece of writing and make it concise um, and make it organized. It should have clarity. It should contain the essential content um, of your program idea. The that content should be coming from your abstract. So that little short description in here should be expanded upon. You know, those two things really need to relate um, and and work with each other. Um, and then, of course, spelling, grammar, punctuation, sentence structure, just basic writing skills. So, you know, I'm a, I'm a decent writer. I always say I'm a bad writer, but I'm a decent writer. But I'm a horrible proofreader. Um, so I can get the information down there and structured, but I need someone to help me um, do the editing process. And when I'm writing proposals, I have multiple people read them. So. I have someone who's really good at grammar, right? Somebody who went to school for English um, and actually like knows the, the structure, knows the punctuation, knows the grammar really, really well. I'm not good at that, but I have a friend who is and they help me out and read my proposals. And they deal with that, that side of it, the, gra the grammar and the, the technical things. Um, but I also have friends who read my proposals who um, are not ceramic artists. Um, not artists at all. They're reading for a different kind of thing. They're reading to make sure that my proposal is clear. Um, they're reading to make sure that I'm not speaking in a language that is not understandable to anyone. Um, because while we get really steeped in, in technique and, and in really specific clay things, it's important when you write a proposal um, that that could be looked at by any person. Um, and understood, and they could have a sense, maybe they, they don't understand the, 
the nitty gritty technical things, but they understand where your proposal is going. Um, so have, it, have your piece proofread. Um, and proofread by multiple people who have different perspectives, um, not just the grammar perspective, but also the perspective of does, is this clear and does this make sense? Um, I think I covered that. <laughs> um, I can't stress it enough though that um, editing your, your five page wandering um, brainstorming document down and making it clear um, is really, really important. But it's really also important that you have that first thing, right? Because um, you can't just write out something that is just concise and just has the essential information. You need to write down all the kind of wandering tributes, tributaries, and then um, figure out what the most essential things are and, and cut that down to something that's concise. One thing I would, would also just add to, to the um, editing part, uh, or when you're sort of finalizing thing, is, is to try and make sure you're using active language as well in your, your proposal, sort of like confident, strong language, as opposed mm -hmm. to like, I would like to explore, like I, I'm going to talk about this. Does that make sense? Um, so you be, you, you're proposing this, we wanna make sure mm -hmm. through the language that you're conveying that you feel confident about talking about this subject and conveying that to an audience. So using active language is a really important key to that, I would say. Um, so I'm sort of gonna go over some other review items, um, just questions that people have in terms of like, how do these get juried? So after we've all, the board has all recovered from conference, um, and everyone submits their things in May 10th, uh, by May 10th, um, gets gathered together, and then we have a board meeting, we'll have a board meeting in Pittsburgh um, in the beginning of June, and all the board members, like, was there 18 of us or so, get sent all the um, proposals, and, um, we read all, every single proposal, over 150 proposals, each board me member reads. And that's within a pretty condensed time period of about a, a week, week and a half. I think last year maybe wasn't even quite that long. Um, so, um, and that's our pleasure to do that, but it's also really important that you know that your proposal needs to stand out. Um, and that's where that program um, guide abstract and title are really key because honestly those are the things that we skim first and then it's like okay does this does this grab me does this seem like something um, that's really good or art, well articulated and thought out and then we'll read through further um, but if if the the title and the abstract are horrendous and like full of spelling mistakes and and not coherent we're likely to just sort of skim over the rest of the thing, and you're likely to get in the, the reject pile, just honestly. Um, so yeah, we all read all the proposals, um, and we judge them based on the general guidelines that you've used to, to write them. Um, in terms of the makeup of the board, it's you know students such as ourselves, um, ceramic enthusiasts, a lot of educators, um, business people, um, so it's, it's a wide range of people that you're, you're speaking to. Um, my little 15 minutes of fame. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Mom will be so proud. Um, so a couple things. What makes a successful proposal? Um, we're looking for it to be well thought out and thought provoking. Um, it's something that's going to share knowledge, experience in ways that are informed, fresh, and unique and is gonna be relevant to the conference theme uh, and or concerns in the field. Um, in terms of uh, just some of the language specifically from the call, what we're looking to see, um, you know, what inspires us today? Uh, how do we keep clay vital? Uh, how are our ideas about uh, and practices of making changing? How are we adapting to the contemporary world? What is at stake as we work to sustain cultural legacies? How can we expand engagement in clay? So those are just some thoughts that are, are in the, um, the program guide, but essentially we want thought-provoking content that, 
that's something new, that's offering a new voice. You know, this is, we just celebrated the 50th anniversary of Enseca. This um, conference keeps changing and evolving, but it, it can only do that with the will of our members who keep proposing new and engaging content or things like the, um, the Fab Lab room mm -hmm. or you know, the process room, that's a relatively new addition. Um, so th if there's something you really wanna do that maybe isn't even, doesn't, you're not quite sure how it would fit, that's a, you know, reach out to us. That may be something that you know, we can accommodate. Um, in terms of addressing the theme of the conference is also a good idea to sort of think about you know, what, what the theme of the conference is. Cross-cultural. Cross cultures, C cross cultural and clay currents. and culture. Cross current clay and oh, culture. I have it right in front of me. The, um, the, so yeah, addressing the theme can be a, a good thought as a way to sort of grab our attention that you're thinking about you know the same things that that we're thinking about with the conference. Um, some other considerations, um, you know, the it's just I, again I can't stress this enough how important it is for the proposals to really grab us. Like, why should I care? There's you know, 100, over 150 proposals. Why should I care? Why would I want to go see your presentation? Um, so yeah, we're looking for, you know, and also who does this serve in our community? Is it a unique perspective? I know this, this conference, I think we have two different panels on um, women and you know, having a family and a career as well. Um, that was a new perspective that we all felt was really worthy of having two panels for, um, as opposed to just ha selecting one of them because we thought it was really relevant and hadn't been really addressed previously. So um, things like that, who, you know, who's it gonna serve in our community and does this offer a new perspective? Um, what we're not looking for, we don't wanna see that it, you're just, you just want 30 minutes to talk about your work and what you do. That's, we're not going to accept those presentations. That's not to say that you can't talk about your experiences. That's, I had a, a student approach me yesterday. He's doing some great work. I think you're over there. Uh, uh, he's like organizing this thing, going to Thailand and you know, work study and, and all this stuff. And he was sort of wondering how he could wrap that into a presentation. I was like, I don't, the presentation for this, you know, this type of presentation format, it wouldn't be about his trip to Thailand, but he could do a trip, about, uh, a presentation about, you know, how he found funding sources, how he organized this, how he, you know, navigated through the university to get credit for it, you know, that kind of thing. So it can totally be about your experiences, but you just want to spin it in a way that it's going to be interesting to someone else. They don't want to see a slideshow of your vacation. We've all sat at our aunt or uncle's house and, you know, for those very painful <laughs> slideshows. So um, just something to think about there. Um, another aspect, again, I think I've covered a lot of these, these points, but it is really important to include your resume and bio in those applications. That's something that, we, that I, I know for one I looked at when there were maybe some questions like, oh, I wonder like if this person has presented before, what, what's this person's track record? Like, why should I think they can stand in front of a room of people for an hour and have a discussion on this specific topic? So it's important to include those documents and, and again, for them to be professionally presented and, and well done so that, again, we, we know that you're gonna pay attention to the details and be able to follow through on what it is that you're, you're um, asking to do. Um, in conclusion, I'm, I'm Canadian, so I always have to include a hockey reference. Uh, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take from the great one, Wayne Gretzky. Um, very true. I can't tell you the number of times I've been like, oh, I, you know, I, won't, get, I won't get that, so I'm not going to apply, and then gone to the show and been like, I could have got into this. I could have done this. Or, you know, you just, you never know. So if you don't apply, you won't know. And it's really great practice to do it as well. It, it can be, you know, tedious and frustrating, but it, it can really help you condense your thoughts in a way that's really useful regardless of whether you, you get it or not. And these things all look great on resume. It's, it's a great way to, um, to build connections um, and give back to the community as well. Uh, I think, yeah. And that's wrapping up. Um, 
do you all have some questions for us about what we've gone over? Well, national is part of the organization's title. Um, we do encourage international membership. Um, we have an international membership, and Naomi herself is an international member. Um, and so, um, uh, but at this point, um, I don't see the organization becoming an international organization. But that being said, um, we accept proposals from anyone. Um, so you can be a someone who is not of the United States and propose to present at INSECA. In that way, we do encourage and would like to broaden the kind of programming that we're, that we're offering. I think we'd had one question oh. here first, and then, yeah. yeah. I have a question to Mike, that's kind of crazy. Um, and it touches on the fact that when I'm in my studio or when I'm in school, the student comes and says, I can't find my bowl. And I'm like, uh, that's not information. You want it square, you want it round, is it thrown, is it hand built, is it slip pads, what kind of bowl, what color is it, you know, all that bowls in my head. My mind works like that. So when I'm thinking of a proposal, my mind explodes with ideas. So mm -hmm. I guess my question is, is there a limit? Because I can sit back right now, I can come up with about 12 proposals, send them all out. That might be in second. So I'm like, is there a, hmm, scaling back invitation of the person should we love the enthusiasm is amazing. Uh, I would say we would be unlikely to accept like two panel, we wouldn't just accept two panels by the same person or two, but there are different streams. Like I, I feel like before we maybe had someone do a process room demo and then also do a d lecture. We but typically would only select one proposal from one person who's who's proposing um, and and that's just we want some diversity in what we're accepting I would say write those 12 proposals and submit them in the next 12 years um, that you know pick pick your favorite one and submit that one and then you know pick another one and work on that you could submit multiple but again you're unlikely to get both of them so you're kind of like you know wasting two bullets Well, um, one of the things is that if you're presenting at as a collective, you'll most likely be presenting a panel. Um, and so with, for panel discussions, we, we request the CVs of all the people who are presenting on the panel. Um, and so that information can easily be provided through the application as it is now. Um, I think that in terms of your, your, your proposal description, if you're writing specifically about what your collective is doing and wanting to share that information, that it's going to be about um, you know, s identifying the things that are unique to your group and that you really feel like the board needs to understand when they're reading your proposal um, and encapsulating some of that in your program description. Most likely, you'll be saying you want to talk about this with a specific like trend to what you're doing and then could include some of the information about what it is that maybe a little bit of history about the organization, especially if part of your presentation is going to be to talk about, say, the history of that organization. Um, the, the limitation may be that four panels, I believe we only allow four people. So it's a moderator plus three presenters. Um, and the moderator's job is really to um, guide the conversation, um, ask questions, and, and rein it in if it gets off topic um, while the presenters are, are there to give the information. So um, there is, and we do give feedback, um, uh, sometimes 
it's best to wait a little bit of time after you get the notice. The reason I say that is because when we're actually, so when we make all those decisions, there's a very quick turnover that has to happen in terms of some of the decisions that are made um, with putting the, that, the programming forward. And so we as board members tend to be very overwhelmed at that time. And so if you ask right away, you're probably less likely to get a response. And I hate saying that. I, I, I wish that everybody would respond immediately, um, but we do get overwhelmed, as everyone does. Um, so waiting a little bit of time. And then also, if you don't hear back following up, because oftentimes, again, around these certain times of the year, um, the board just has a lot of homework, our homework, that we have to do. Um, and so it becomes a little bit difficult to follow up. The other suggestion that I have is to, um, is to reach out and ask uh, whether or not there's someone else that you can talk to about feedback. Um, because sometimes you're getting, everybody is getting notifications from the same person, but the board collectively decides on the programming. And so you may be able to talk to someone else on the board who's not as swamped as that person who sent you that letter. Okay, so you, you, you think I'd just like to send an email to somebody on the board? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and I think, you know, sending it to, you probably receive your notifications from Mary Clunan, our programs coordinator. Um, so I would say send it to her, but send it to another board member as well at the same time. That way, you know, if Mary is too busy with putting together the guide and working with the board to get these proposals to actually the next step, um, someone else on the board can step up to get you what you need. The exhibition, the exhibition proposals are done um, through a different process, and so um, they're juried by our on-site liaisons and an independent uh, juror. Um, we pick a different one each year. Um, I'm not, I don't know a lot about the actual process that is gone through for that juring, <coughs> just that it's the two on-sites and a, an independent jury. We have both 30 minute, 60 minute, and then the 90 minute panels. Yeah. And there's also, um, we have these this new program stream that started last year called Blink 2020, which is Pachakacha style presentations where you have 20 slides, they're up for seven seconds a piece, so it's about seven minute presentation. It's it's just a quick, for, for people who wanna like present, but don't wanna take up a lot of time. And one thing I, we didn't mention, the programming streams, like um, head themes, are changing slightly for next year. It's not mm -hmm. quite live on the website, but um, I know we have also have um, topical discussions, which are sort of a more casual, informal discussion with a, you are, you know, someone, whoever proposes it is the leader for that discussion. Um, they're more like round tables, yeah. so not necessarily with the slides, it's, it's more like a discussion, a small group discussion. So I think that's changing to like a short form style and, or something mm -hmm. like that, but there are different ways to get involved and we've got the student, um, the student ones as well. Do we have any other questions? Thank you all for Thank coming. Thank you so much. Yeah. We look forward to reading your presentations. Thank you.